Hello, everyone. Welcome to Safer Journeys, a podcast dedicated to raising children, ending violence, and ending oppression. I'm Heather. I'm one of the preventionists here at Safe Journeys. And I'm Melissa, the Community Engagement Director and with the Prevention Program staff at Safe Journeys, the Domestic and Sexual Violence Agency in Illinois, serving LaSalle and Livingston counties. We are so lucky to have our special guest again, Emily. And so welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me again. Uh, My fun fact, like uh, last week I gave you a fun fact. This week's fun fact, um, if if, if I could describe my personality with a breakfast cereal this time. Oh, heck yeah. What is that? Oh, yeah. Um, Do you remember Cookie Crisps? (laughs) Do I remember? (laughs) Of course. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, There's very little nutritional value to them, which is the way I eat. Um, So that works out beautifully with my personality (laughs) as well. Um, But like you... It, like any good cookie, you've got a, you've got the base, you've got a solid foundation, and then sprinkled in there are these just a little gems of chocolate wherever, wherever you run across one. I'm even a fan, believe it or not, of oatmeal raisin cookies or cran cranberry cookies. Ooh, huh. yeah, they don't have those in cereal though, do they? I the, don't think what, so. The cranberry cookie? like an oh, oatmeal no, raisin no. cookie crisp. Oh. It's just chocolate chip, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure they would call that oatmeal. I'm not not. Not trying to be a hater, hater. <laughs> no, but. it's fine. It's totally fine. My mom <laughs> yeah. used to let me eat all that sugary stuff. Oh, like yeah. I, which is funny because she would put half the sugar in a Kool-Aid, but like she would then like sit me down in front of yeah. cartoons with a bowl of cookie crisp like it was nothing. Yeah. That's amazing. I so uh, if my kid was listening to this right now, she'd be like, that's an Estee cereal. <laughs> that's right. It is an Estee cereal. <laughs> Saturday or Sunday. Right. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. But then she talks yeah. me into, cause she'll throw maybe like a little fit and I'm like, okay, is this, is this battle worth it? But, right. uh, oh, and yeah. then it becomes an M day cereal and a T day cereal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, no. for me, it's my dessert, you know, no, like, yeah. I definitely eat Cinnamon Toast Crunch for dessert. Oh, oh that's delicious. That, that was my favorite cereal growing up. Yeah. Still is my favorite cereal. Yeah. So, so hopping over, this is again, probably something we want to edit, but um, maybe not the, the Kool-Aid. Um, <laughs> I was on a mission trip to a third world country and they like, this was their way of like spreading it out was to like half the packet to the amount of water that was given. And nobody told me that. And um, anyway, I, in, in those situations, used that as, a, as the means of being able to eat. So I, I would rarely chew what was in front of me. I would just put it in my mouth and then swallow. And I remember I, I had something, I again, whatever it was in my mouth, I did not want it in my mouth. But um, they had this horrible orange, um, like I can't even call it Kool-Aid because there wasn't even enough in it to be like Kool-Aid. And anyway, like choking at the table as I, as I was like, this is not going well. This is, oh. not, this is not going well. So anyway, anytime somebody shares with me about their Kool-Aid experience, I'm like, no, I respect that 100%. I, I get why we save money, but let's not save it there. You're like, it is 86 it's, cents or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how much it is anymore. But. Like, I'll, I'll figure out a way to get us more. But yeah, it was intense. Oof. So, yeah, fun story. I'm sorry about your trauma right (laughs) well and I just want to say I know I said the thing about the Estee cereal but like what a gift that you're like Estee cereal because you bring that fun and uh make moments really meaningful and like it's an Estee like and I know like that's our weekend day for us so um that's yeah Yeah, I I I am a Saturday girl that that works for me I I like that that. I'll take it (laughs) All right, friends, we have to do a quick trigger warning, as always. Um, So we will be talking about particularly child sexual abuse prevention today. Um, So if anything is too much for you, you're just not feeling it, no worries. Take a minute, take care of yourself, do what you need to do to feel good today. That's right. And so our content for today is, again, about prevention education in the schools, just like Episode 8. And so if you haven't heard Episode 8 yet, I encourage you to stop Episode 9 for now and backtrack so that you can hear the first part of this conversation. And then we can just jump right back in uh, to talking about the more about the content yeah. of uh, Aaron's Law that we are teaching in the classroom and eventually Our goal is to be educating and empowering our caregivers and educators who see the kids on like a daily basis and a weekly basis um, in a way that we'll never be able to do as safe journeys um, because we have to cover so much ground. Um, And so we want to be empowering other people to know how to teach these things and, and let them know that 
they can. Oh, like, yeah. They will be okay. We are here as a consultant and as support and resources, but they can do it. They can meet their prevention education mandates, and we know that. We we have full faith in them. And so whatever we need to do, and if it's, you know, providing this episode to them so that they can sure. hear how yep. and why we teach the way we do, uh, then we'll give those to them. Yeah. But. So just jumping right mm-hmm. into um, that Aaron's Law requirement, uh, the child sexual abuse prevention education, we have to be teaching about trusted adults. We have to be teaching kids to recognize, you know, when they're being touched in a way that um, is not okay. And so telling them about their private body parts and saying, like, nobody should be touching those except to keep you healthy or a bigger person shouldn't be touching those. And then actually that it's a pretty short list, actually, of who should be touching those pro- private body parts. And if at all. How, uh, if at yeah. all. And like the, I, I think labeling the setting of when that's happening yes. is powerful of like when you're sick, that's a great time to see this in action. Otherwise, you know, we're really looking for that autonomy, that 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 ability to do that for themselves. Yeah. Yes, that's right. And so let's just jump right in. Like how in the world, like so just viewing this as a way, like a platform and a tool to educate the caregivers yeah. uh, in our counties, but also just all around who are listening to this podcast how do you talk about private body parts with kiddos? Yeah, so one of the things is I want to really stress that we really try to approach it from a developmental standpoint. Yes. So as much as I want to make it understandable and digestible for adults, um, my gig is more of am I doing this in a way that is going to empower and be retentive to a child? Mm-hmm. So for starters, with the K through 2 group, um, we, we teach – the swimsuit rule right now is what public education really likes um, because it's quote unquote safe uh, for them. They don't feel like we're ripping any band-aids off or talking about stuff we shouldn't be talking about. Um, So we show a picture of a boy and a girl playing in a sprinkler on a hot summer day. And my question is, do those kids have exactly the same bathing suit? And the kids, of course, go, no, Miss Emily. They're like, oh, this Miss Emily, she doesn't know what she's she doing. She obviously has a look at her own fool. picture. Yeah, <laughs> come on. Um, but I say it really doesn't matter what our party, private body parts are. It matters that it's covered by that bathing suit. Now, I take it a step further. You don't have to. But I ask the boys in the room, I'll say, would it be uncomfortable or weird if you were at a water park and somebody came up and put their finger in your belly button? And they're like, yes, (laughs) please don't do that. (laughs) Yes, it is. So I talk about how like pretty much from our bellies or belly buttons, whether it's girls in two pieces or boys in in a bathing suit, it doesn't really matter. Our belly is pretty much considered a private body part. And then I'll also say just to the effect, our chest is also normally considered a private body part, whether it's covered or not. That's what we're going to go with. I like that you go right there because kids have said to me in the classroom, like, "Um, Miss Melissa, do you realize that there's there are bo- private body parts showing in that picture and I'm like mm, yeah oh wait what and then she's like I see his nipples yeah. and I'm like well you said the name of the private body part not me I just gotta say that like wait 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 please inform the listeners why you feel <laughs> concerned about saying the name of the pro because I don't want anybody to think that, that we're, we're sh- yes yeah. exactly. no absolutely not there's a reason yeah we actually like It has been said to us, we cannot teach the anatomical names of the private body parts in the classroom with the kids because, and the reasoning is, is because they should be learning this at home and because they're too young. And this is what we're we're hearing from the schools i don't mm-hmm. want you all to think that this is what we were right. thinking this well, is multiple districts how about that multiple well and districts i'll have add come forward to say that yes and i'll add another reason is because um the school is not the place to learn this per administration per the administrators right not us like we we think it, every place is a place to learn uh, about caring for our bodies and being safe and i think it's it's What's the unfortunate part of this conversation is that a lot of adults get mixed up in that we're trying to push an agenda. And I want to be really careful that, uh, yes, there, I mean, obviously by nature of what Safe Journeys is and, and what we do for survivors, we do have a foot in the policy end of the world. Um, but when it comes to prevention, my job is I'm, I am in zero political uh, mode when I'm teaching. Yes. 
and I'm not pushing any agendas. I genuinely am coming from a point of safety and wanting to have that conversation. So no, I'm not talking about um, gay or bi or LGBTQ uh, rights or anything. I'm not talking about um, any gender or gender fluid. Literally, we're talking very specific animal anatomical po- body parts. And my, my comment to Melissa when I started this is I'm, I'm like, I grew up in 4-H. I learned more from 4-H about anatomical body parts than I did in our like... I don't know, like 10th grade health class, kind of like the nuts and bolts, if you will. Yeah. Um, And I just, I think specifically with what we see in research right now and the number of kids coming forward to, to, to seek help for sexual violence, like, and we've got to, we've got to be better at equipping them and it can't be about our fears or our issues. I agree. Um, But anyway, so as that goes forward, we certainly want to be mindful of that and we try really hard to work with those um, admins. And if you are somebody who, who feels strongly that you can't say specific things, but when I'm teaching, I ask for the right, or at least in most of these districts, to, to list two. So mm-hmm. I, I try to say uh, penis and I try to say vulva are the yeah. two that I try to be specific with. Just because, um, again, when, when adults say them out loud right now that we were shaming kids. Yeah. A hundred percent we're shaming kids when we say it because they're like, as an adult, your face gets really red or you get really uncomfortable and you talk really fast or you, again, there's just so many subtle things that we do when we say it, that we convince the kid that it's dirty somehow. Mm -hmm. So trying to really eliminate that stigma is huge. I think. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that because I really do feel that way as well. Like the more we make it a big deal to say the names, the more power we're giving to the people who could potentially hurt the kiddos, right? Like, yeah. and there are so many good reasons to be able to say the name of your private body part. If someone has, you know, a, a rash or something going on in, with their private body part, being able to specifically say like, yeah. you know, my, my penis is itchy or burns Mm -hmm. or whatever the case might Mm be like, it's not just preventing violence. It's helping them get the appropriate health care that they need. Yeah. Uh, So I mean, a hundred percent. And and I think that's something for any caregiver listening is the way that you approach it. Like, obviously you don't want to be standing in Kroger with your kid yelling the word penis. Sure. Like (laughs) that that's so like part of this conversation with kids is like, yeah, we do consider them private because they are yours and yours alone. Um, and so this is something that we want to kind of be careful about when we talk about it or who we talk about with these things. Um, and you can do that in a way. And I love that we list the books or a different book each time on here. But there are so many good books out there that teach good body autonomy and good body identification that like, in my opinion, there's no excuse. Go to your public library, ask a librarian, um, I have yet to meet one that won't help you find a book that helps identify that with you and your kid. That's because librarians are amazing and wonderful. A hundred percent. We are big fans. (laughs) Yes, we absolutely are. Okay. So you teach the swimsuit rule. Yep. um, And using those correct terms, we did mention this when we talked to Aaron Marin. um, I think we talked about this in grooming as well. So gosh, y'all probably sick of hearing us talk about why it's so important to name private body parts. Um, But it does help. Um, if a predator hears a young, young kid say, Hey, that's my vulva, that's my penis, you know, leave my nipple alone, whatever they immediately are like, this kid's been educated. This cat has adults in their world that they can talk to about this subject. And this is not going to be my next victim because I will get caught if I do that to this child. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. And you mentioned, I think it was in the last episode, that the mouth is a private body part. And I I know last summer, we actually encountered this last school year from a school social worker who teaches that the mouth is a private body part. And it's in actually our our media we love this week, the book that we're going to um, have a link to in the show notes. And so uh, do you want to talk more about how you teach about that? Um, so I, I stay pretty, uh, for me, pretty light in it only so far as that most kids, I don't think are ready to have the conversation about like what it can truly imply. Um, right. right? Um, but at the same time I talk about how, like if somebody walked up to you, whether you know them or not and shoved a cheeseburger in your mouth, um, now you may love cheeseburgers, you may hate them. It doesn't matter. But like somebody took the power of choice away from you and has now put something there that they shouldn't have. And I think it was again this week I had 
a second grader again. Those um, second graders, the second graders, graders are, are it. on it. They are just knocking it out of the park. But um, she looked at me kind of funky, and we had actually been talking about, um, I think, the always ask first rule or anything. Okay. And anyway, anyway, she looked at me and she goes, you know, nobody but a dentist should really be messing around in there. And I was like, yeah. I think that's a great way to look at it. Yeah. Um, now, I also, if they're littles, I will ask them to look at their arms. Bear with me. Um, and I say, oh, look, nobody has feathers. And they're like, <laughs> yeah, no. And I'm like, okay, look at your friend's face. Do they have the raccoon mask on? No. And I say, oh, that's right, because you're not a raccoon, nor are you a seagull. So let's not scavenge. Oh, cool. I like that. Because a lot of kids will get back in the minivan yeah. and they're eating like six week old gummies it's and tr- oh French God, fries yeah. that have been there too it's, long. And you're like, come on. My friend's child picked up an M&M off of the nope. city of Chicago nope. sidewalk <laughs> and put it in her mouth. Nope. And I almost threw up. Yeah. And she, she was fine, by the way. Right. But if like we're talking about infection, right? Like whether yeah. it be from whatever, you're like, yeah, that's a that's a surefire way to get that, buddy. Yeah. Cool. Um, now you have 10 diseases. No, <laughs> right. Um, but anyway, I, I certainly think that it's on the radar. Most kids, I think, are pretty good about this one without us even talking about it just cool. because um, it, with the way that the cafeteria system works in most schools now, it's l- in my day, right? Like it was, a, it was an open floor training. Like, you know, I mean, it was just financial that I have two Oreos and I can get pretty much a full lunch for, for two Oreos if I oh, trade out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but the way that our, our cafeteria system has moved to, whether it be because of COVID or because of the way that the financial softwares work, um, every kid is getting about the same thing. Um, and so it's really kind of, that's my tray and you can't touch my tray. Um, you can't eat what I eat, that sort of thing. Should we talk about boundaries? Yes, please. Let's talk about boundaries. So I know. Ooh, you, can I clarify? Yeah, yeah. That, well, that go ahead. You just start. Okay. Well, I was going to talk about how most adults don't like to talk about boundaries with kids because we're not good at them ourselves. <laughs> yeah. And so when it comes to trying to keep, teach kids like body regulation, emotional regulation and control, um, we we feel like we need to either model what we've been doing or like be like, be like that person, not like me. And then continue to model the negative or the lack of good boundaries. Um, and so, and, and this is not me. I I am nothing if not super supportive of public education and those who work within its field. Um, but I, I think one thing right now with teacher burnout, Mm. like it's really hard to show good balance and good, like, um, just good all around steps to being a well-rounded human. And so I think when, then when we come to specifically prevention education and we're trying to say what are boundaries, that's a whole lot harder conversation because I'm undoing and redoing um, damage done by other people. Now that's not to say that we're not all human and that we all don't, you know, working through our own baggage and things like that. Like, but I think on a mass scale, kids today don't see us doing good at setting boundaries. No, I think you're right. And so then when I, when it, when they get a phone and they see us on our phone all the time, Mm -hmm. why can't I model that? Why can't I do that? Or then when I am allowed it on the weekend, I don't have any emotional regulation or control because I'm just sitting there on my phone the entire time. Yeah. So I think boundaries start long before the conversation of prevention education or or violence education is that like, come on, y'all, like we've got to do our best that little eyes and ears are watching constantly. And even like... um, I I'm, I'm I volunteer at a church on the weekends, and it's interesting the ones who can put their phone in their pocket versus the ones who have to constantly have it, you know, in their hand or so forth. And again, what does that tell a child who's in my presence that I continue to check my phone that 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 phone is more important than they are? Mm-hmm. Um, so be careful what our subtle messages are. Um, yeah. So I think the first conversation about boundaries goes out to adults. Of like, oh God, yeah gosh, we got to check ourselves and, yeah. and do you, do your own hard work um, to show up to the table, um, especially when it comes to electronics. I know we're not talking about online stuff just yet, but like this funnels into that conversation yeah. about online um, acceptability and boundaries and things like that. So, um, but with kids, I teach something called angry crossing guard. Okay. Tell me about angry crossing guard. And it, it kind of was born out of um, in the second steps material. They have this, this stance, if you will, that they want you to teach the children. And I could never really get it right or get them to mimic me correctly. Mm-hmm. And so <laughs> me being me um, was like, well, that looks like an angry crossing guard. And it stuck. 
Um, and so angry crossing guard is the concept of a refusal. Okay. So how do you say no effectively? And most kids either run away or they'll scream or they'll throw something or they'll um, whisper, right? So there's very little n- what we can consider normal or appropriate communication happening. And so this is teaching them how do we speak in a voice that people can understand? What am I supposed to be doing with my body when I'm trying to communicate something that's important to me? Um, how do I how do I get all of the things, all of the signals that I have in my body to be going in the right direction at the right time? So a refusal is this. You plant your feet, you put your hand out like you're an angry crossing guard, like that car that's trying to creep through the intersection. Somebody's yeah. driving too fast. That's right. So like you get your kind of like, oh, no, you didn't look on your face, right? Like maybe some eyebrow action. I, right I, for so, me there'd be some big eyebrows yeah, oh, yeah maybe maybe a little bit of the scrunchy face yeah. right okay yeah. I would be sassy yeah and I'm I'm real clear to say that when we hold our hand out I am not hitting or pushing in any way shape or form all I'm doing is that we know that the handout is a universal sign in our culture for stop so that's number one we want it to stop the second thing is that by me extending my arm with angry crossing guard is that I have established my boundary right? I've established my bubble, especially if you just hurt me, you are no longer welcome in this space. Yeah. Um, so I have my stop out. I have my, my bubble or my boundary established. My face is matching my mood or what I'm trying to get done. And then I ask them to think about their mom or their teacher. And have you ever heard mom or teacher use that voice? The one, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> yes. And I, 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 I amp it up and I say, do they have the look Where, like, you don't even hear anything. It's just, you know. It's the loudest. mm -hmm. It's the loudest look that you'll ever get. Yeah. Like, uh, you know how, like, certain people say you can't look at me in that tone of voice? I'm like, oh, no, I got a lot of that as a kid, for sure. So we want all of that going in the direction of whoever has either given me an unsafe touch or is attempting to do something that I don't like. Um, So the angry crossing guard is essentially what we would... In, in actual vernacular call a refusal. Okay. So it's it's a way to say stop or no to something. And then we talk about what words would be appropriate to use with that and why giggling or laughing sends a mixed message. Oh, I didn't realize you, you shared that. I mean, that's brilliant and you absolutely should be. But I did not, I was not aware of that, that aspect. Yeah, because like I, I think a lot of them, and we talk about how like truly when you get uncomfortable, we have human nature responses. Yeah, we do. And like, of course, when you're uncomfortable and somebody's doing something weird, you're going to be like, <laughs> yeah, me and Melissa had to mention it on the podcast. We're like, by the way, when we giggle, cause we feel weird and awkward yeah. <laughs> or we're trying to lighten up something super dark. Right. And we're like, talk- yeah, we're talking about something like really, really yeah. dark. And then yeah. we're like laughing in, in just like you're saying, um, I think it's really powerful that you're teaching kids these particular skills to know because it was interesting like I had a supervisor tell me when I was saying something serious into the microphone to my congregation um, I I was smiling and that my mood like what I was saying didn't match what my face was saying and I was like oh I didn't even realize I did that yeah, but it's, it's a coping. It's a coping mechanism, 100%. and it's a skill that I um, developed as a child. But right there's the key word, and this is what I want adults to hear: is it's a skill. Yeah. So this is something that is trainable. This is something that is adaptable. This is going to morph and model what's being done in front of them. Yeah. So like in my family, bear with me. We laugh when we get scared, and I'm not talking about like a gentle chuckle or a wayward laugh. It is a cackle, like it is a deep belly cackle laugh, and like we have literally had to sit down my mom has sat down with me before and be like you know this isn't really a, like across the board thing so some people may look at you a little different but like it's a skill that you have to like look at and say I can practice this I can work at this yeah. that means I'm not going to always going to get it right I'm going to learn from that failure I'm going to step back up to the plate and I'm going to keep working on this because those communication skills especially when it comes to boundaries is is how you communicate that to everybody else. So I value your your boundaries, but if I don't know what they are, it's a lot harder for me to be a respectful human being. So this communication is a skill that we have to be able to to teach ourselves but also our kids. I know we say this so many times, but this is the kind of education I wish I would have had Mm -hmm. growing up. Yeah. 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 I'm not sure I ever was told how to say no. 
No. Because I was taught you do what an adult says because you're a kid and they're an adult and they know better. That's right. And if they question me on this, I, I want to be as respectful as I can to the authority. And so sometimes we'll say, you know, like talk to your parents at home or whoever's in charge at home to kind of get a good read on what you need to do. But I will say stuff like sometimes when it's a safety issue, we don't, adults aren't going to stop and ask you. They're just going to do something. So they may take your hand and they, and they didn't ask for consent before they took your hand. Mm -hmm. And that needs to be okay because above all, they're going to keep you safe. But otherwise, after the fact, it's always okay to go up to that person and be like, Hey, you know, I really don't like it when you hold my hand then, or I really don't like it that I have to do Mm -hmm. this. Is there a reason for that? And I empower kids to ask for the why, right? Is that, it's okay to be like, I don't understand the motivation for this because a lot of times I'm getting bad behavior or bad feedback off of a kid when in reality they didn't think they were doing anything wrong to begin with. Yeah, that's probably more likely the case than not. Yes. Yeah. So so really empowering the kids to ask the question of like, hey, mom, I know you like to hold my hand. I really don't like doing it in this space. Is it okay if I don't hold your hand yeah. here? Um, so I, I think boundaries are, are super critical. And I think the other point to caregivers too is, uh, I have a, a parent who is very much physical touch is a is a love language. They enjoy that. Um, I am an introverted hobbit is what I tell people. Um, and I'm, I'm not huge on physical touch. Now, do I hug the people I love? Absolutely. Do I enjoy holding hands with certain people? Sure. But if if you were just to blindside hug me, um, you have a it's a decent safety risk. Don't do it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So like, Tim, so like sometimes you're raising humans that have a different love language. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so your boundary levels look different. So that, that parent who very much enjoys physical touch didn't necessarily model for me how to effectively say no in a way that wasn't disrespectful. And, and that's what I think angry crossing guard is so important is that it's teaching kids that it's okay to look at grandpa and say, Hey grandpa, I don't want to kiss. I do want to hug or Hey grandma, I don't really want to sit on your lap today, but can I sit next to you? So we're, exchanging what we are uncomfortable with for what we're comfortable with well and I know you're not trying like the goal in this isn't teaching healthy relationships I mean it is but like that's what's happening because you're negotiating you're making a compromise with somebody you're saying I see what you want I'm telling you what I want What's this middle ground that's going to make us both happy? Yeah. And I think the boundary conversation does need to extend into what we talk about with middle schoolers. So we don't spend a ton of time, at least in LaSalle County, specifically in middle and high school. But when we are there, we are teaching healthy relationships. And so one of the things that I teach them, and and you can disagree, listeners, you can totally disagree with me on this. But one of my things is when I'm teaching middle schoolers about like physical interaction or physical intimacy, and I don't go much farther than that. I just say, what you feel comfortable with your partner. You have never been modeled this. Yeah. Like this is a relationship that nobody walks out in front of you and says, this is appropriate. So when it comes to things like consent in this age bracket, I say, it's totally okay to say, I've never done that before. Let's do it. And to get into it and have your panic moment and be like, nope, 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 not it, not it, not it. However, you have to communicate that. Yeah. And if you can't talk about it, so if you can't say, let's make out without giggling, probably not ready to physically get into the waters where that's going to be happening because my communication level is so weak with it. Yeah, very good. Very good point. And I, I want to add to that, too, because if we if we also teach about body language and about like if you notice your intimate partner starting to freeze, maybe check in with them. Say, okay, what do you think? Like, is this still what's something up? you want? Yeah, <laughs> yeah like yeah. what's going on for you? Why why are, you I don't see seem like you freaked out yeah, yeah. what's going on? Like just start yeah, to yeah. reflect what you yeah. see. <laughs> it doesn't seem like you're yeah. into this. Like that's what I'm thinking. What are you thinking right now? Yeah, and I think with boundaries, we have to have the, the definition to consent, right? Which yeah. is like yes. freely given, it's reversible. All of those things that, that go into making a very clear thing, but also learning... <laughs> Our culture doesn't lose well um, or we don't like rejection. And so teaching that it's okay that your partner doesn't want to go there. That's not a reflection on you. And so internalizing that to this level where you're going to force somebody else down a pathway is wrong. Well, and that's where we end up with sexual assault. And you end up with somebody who's committed sexual assault, who in all honesty, I don't think went into it thinking yeah. oh, I'm no, going to commit yeah. sexual assault. Mm-hmm. So like, and, and that's not an excuse that doesn't no, get them out no. of the trouble, but it, 
it, I think that there's an awareness here of like, because we're not talking about this, because we get uncomfortable with it, our kids are out there experimenting and learning without the, the, the gate, <laughs> I'm a big gatekeeper, but without that gate, without that fence to be able to say, this is where I'm safe. This is what I can do. Yeah, no, that it, that's very valuable and, and not just in these conversations, but in any time you're going to interact with another human or yeah. animal. Yeah. Well, and teaching how to handle rejection. Holy cow. That's a life skill. Uh, well, yeah. no, it's not necessarily one I've grasped great. No, no, it's, it's tough. It's tough for adults. And so as you can imagine, right, like if it's a, if it's tough for adults and we're not having these conversations, then like you say, mm -hmm. you they're out there exploring and they're not really knowing how they're going to handle rejection yet. And then when they do, it might not go very well. Yeah. yeah. And it, I, I, the analogy I might give you is that like, <laughs> think about adults and, and the supplements that we take, right? Sometimes okay. we don't even know that we're deficient in something. And so when the doctor comes to you and is like, hey, you should probably be taking some vitamin D. And you're like, you don't recognize the benefit to it until suddenly you're on the supplement and you're like, wow, I feel so much better. Oh, yeah. That's like, a great way good. to describe it. Mm -hmm. And so like with consent, I think everybody panics because we think consent is only when it comes to physical intimacy, which of course it does apply. But in my world, Consent starts with a, with a two-year-old of saying, hey, may I hold your hand and waiting for the answer. Yeah. And so like teaching yourself, like I think that's the biggest thing I can take away for adults I can give you is like you are being observed anyway and whether you like it or not. <laughs> yeah. And so let's make sure the, the information that we're giving and teaching is actually factual mm -hmm. um, and, and researched. And no, I don't think everybody who teaches consent has to talk about physical intimacy or dating no, relationships no, no. in any capacity. Um, what's been really interesting, at least specific to the schools I've been in lately, talking about friendships and consent. Yeah. And how the phrase, you can't be my friend unless you do, oh, or unless you're yeah. there. And how that's actually more of a bullying statement than it yeah. is a friend statement. Manipulative. Yeah, 100%. And how manipulation and control, right? When mm -hmm. we talk about domestic violence and how that's the root of it. Yes. Bullying has very similar yeah. roots. It just looks a little bit differently because we don't have the same power structure attached to it. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, yeah, I, I with with boundaries and, and discussions, I think sometimes we think we're doing all we can, but because we're deficient and we haven't done our own research, it comes across in how we communicate it with students. Well yeah. said. Yes. All right. I want to make sure we hit on talking about Internet safety before our time is up. So I know we're going to go way more in depth on a different episode, but what things would you like to share um, with our listeners about internet safety and prevention education? Um, yeah, sorry. Is that you're like a lot of things <laughs> <laughs> to, to you? You just described a campfire to me. It's like a forest fire. I'm like, Oh crud. Oh <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. We just got so many things. You just open all the doors. Ugh. Um, and I'll be really clear. I am not your tech person. Like, <laughs> sure. They see me coming and they, they literally either run in fear or giggle. Um, so I am not the tech person, but what I'm learning is that if you ask a question of a kid, so like yesterday, I held out my cell phone to the fourth graders and I said, could you do more with this than I could? And without fail, every one of them was like 100% I could. Yeah. And uh, they were talking about Roblox and Fortnite and hacking. Now, I don't fully understand this, um, but apparently there is a component now of like you can hack somebody else's account to get their stuff. I don't know. Anyway, it, but like my point to that is these kids are doing things without regard mm -hmm. um, because there is no precedent set sure. in front of yeah. what is safe, what is appropriate. And so they are going to get mad at you when you take their phone away or restrict their phone use. And going back to boundaries, it is my job as the gatekeeper to set appropriate boundaries. And we talk about how upset they get when somebody in a chat feature is being really mean. And I'm not talking about just like, you know, you suck. I mean, we're talking about like major, um, major things that if we were talking real world would probably be liable for causing harm yeah. down the line. And so we have to talk about accountability when it comes to cyber stuff. What they say is out there. They have no concept that what they post will never go away. Even oh, yeah. 
And uh, it's terrifying to me that third graders and fourth graders have Snapchats. I agree. If I could vote one application off the face of the planet, it would be Snapchat. Not because I don't think it's a cool piece of technology that initially was used as a messaging platform. But with the concept of Snapchat, and for anybody who doesn't know, um, in theory, the message dissolves or goes away. Now, it doesn't magically disappear off the servers. So, like, if you are a forensic investigator, you can certainly find some of those things. However, by the nature of the way that the code is written, it does dissolve some of that information, which then makes tracking this so much harder. So now we have things like inappropriate pictures and TikToks and videos and things being transmitted that... The kid is very scarred by, but A, shouldn't have been there in the first place and doesn't want to get in trouble for it, so lets it just go by the wayside. So now our predators have access and are grooming those students um, while while you're in the same room with them, um, and you would never know. Yuck, Emily. I mm. have not heard anybody say while you're in the same room with them. Oh, like, yeah. This is the first time I just heard that, and it made me want to throw up. Yeah. It really does. Um, And it makes me think about like, you know, we might even be finding ways to connect with our kids um, in the same room, texting back and forth if that's how your kid is communicating best with you right now. I text my 18-year-old repeatedly. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But even just thinking like they're going through so much more on their phone than you are right now because I don't know how they do it. I honestly don't because I can't multitask like they do. with the phone. Mm-hmm. I it blows my mind how many platforms they can be on at once. I I literally like I can only handle two. Yeah. Um and, and beyond that, I'm like I got to get rid of this because mm-hmm. it's yeah. really taking my life down. Like yeah. I can't do yeah. it. But that they could be experiencing it when they're on the same like couch as you. Yeah. Right? And I asked these kids point blank. I said, "Why wouldn't you come?" Because I, I I said, "How should we handle it?" was the first question. And everybody pretty much across the board was like, "Delete it. Delete it right now. Delete the app, delete the evidence, whatever it is, delete it." And I said, "But everything that we've talked about up until now, when we seek good help from adults, we should probably have that information with us when we go to them." And then the terror sets in, right? Like the terrified look of like, "You want me to show my mom that?" And my call out to all of the caregivers is I would have this conversation long before the problem ever pops up and set your precedences. Um, Hey, I want you to come to me if this happens. Um, And I tell kids all the time, I'm like, they're going to have a human moment. You might hear the prairie dog yip (laughs) yip, (laughs) or the gasp of fear of like, what are you doing? You know? Yeah. But every one of them said the main fear was that they were going to get in trouble. And I think as adults, I can take the fear out of that real fast. Yeah. I can say, hey, nope, I totally understand this is not your fault. Um, But that to them, remember, taking their phone away is a punishment. So like, hey, man, this isn't about me punishing you for for somebody else's actions. But I need to be able to make sure that you are in a safe environment. And I know who has access to you. So I need to borrow the phone for a few days while I get get this figured out oh sure yeah like um, privacy settings and things of that nature and we talk about the legal ramifications even mm-hmm. at, at fourth grade level we're talking about how like hey guys if you text this on to somebody else so let's say somebody sent you a private body part picture and you didn't know what to do with it so you text it to your friend you've now distributed it so like you didn't mean to yeah yeah but you're still a part of the problem and now you've given someone child sexual abuse material yes yep which is illegal for adults and children yeah yep. like that's child pornography yeah. and, and we, we talk about how like in. taking so if somebody's asking you to take a picture and send it to them of a yeah. private body part how that is also considered um now with fourth grade i'm not using pornography in well, the classroom sure, sure. but like i say like that's something that the police are going to be able to to investigate and potentially um, bring you to court over is that that this is stuff that can't be happening and i and i try to end those cyberbullying lessons on like if anybody is asking you for anything, if anybody says anything or sends you anything that makes your belly kind of go flip flop, I think those are all times to go to adults. And so that's where as caregivers, like if we can set the precedent, hey, I'm not mad at you. I'm not going to yell at you and I'm not going to punish you in the first 15 minutes of this conversation, right? So that you're giving your own brain time to process this and your own time to think about it. Um, and do your own research of knowing what is child pornography, what is distri- distribution of inappropriate pictures. What do I do if this guy's in California and he's contacting my Illinois teenager or girl or whatever it is, mm-hmm. you know? 
But like, what are your legal rights? Um, is this a co- phone call to our police? Is this a federal case? Like, um, and I can't answer all those questions in this episode, but like <laughs> prepare yourself. Like this is what kills me about this conversation in particular with, with online stuff and with grooming adults adopt an ostrich approach. We shove our heads down in the ground and say, because I didn't have to go through this, it's not a problem. And I'm going to ignore it at all costs. And I'm going to, and I'll, and, and this is the way that I'm going to approach it. And how sad that our students are, are then still on a battlefield, still needing reinforcements, still needing help, knowing when and how to handle things. And I've got my head in the sand. So at some point we have to pick our heads up and we have to have a conversation about what is internet safety specific to our family? What is internet safety for our school? Um, and then empowering as many community members to join in on that as well. But yeah, uh, sexting is a big thing right now. Um, teaching kids to use the report or block features that are built into those applications is critical. Um, and that it's not that they don't want to be that kid's friend anymore. So if they know him from school, But if that kid is inappropriately using those things, devices, then absolutely you need to block them or mute them or whatever it is. Um, But using those things to protect yourself is critical. How old or at what age do we need to start having these discussions with kids? Nobody's going to like my answer to this. I think you need to be having this if they have access to technology. So I would say as soon as kindergarten rolls around and they get a Google iPad or a Google Pad, whatever, from school, mm-hmm. you need to be starting to talk about what, what things are out there on the Internet mm-hmm. and that there are people who can cause harm, um, that not everybody's your friend, not everybody loves you. Um, and how do we, how do we, what does that look like for you and your family in order to keep safe? But I would say because, yeah, I mean, when I talked to the third and fourth grade there was zero flinch. Most of them, I would say 80% had phones and the, the, the 20% that didn't easily had iPads and tablets and things yeah. like that. Yes. The access they have to information at such a young age is wild, especially like to us born in like the eighties. Um, I know like we were just getting dial up internet, you know, like at the yeah. end of eighth grade or so you know and so I didn't have these moments as a child to know what it was like and so I love how you say we don't really have precedence for this so we have to create them by initiating the conversation and I believe there is a site called the porn conversation which I know people might not be comfortable with that however um, what it does is gives us as caregivers really good tangible resources so that we can have these conversations at age and developmentally appropriate levels with them because like you said you're not necessarily saying the word porn in fourth grade but that is what you're talking about actually when you talk about these explicit images that like of private body parts that are coming across their apps and phones and all of that yeah there's two organizations that i would bring to mind here one is operation underground railroad they have really come out with a lot of really good stuff for caregivers as far as like what to do with technology and where your kids are at and protecting them online um the other one is one love um one love has a lot of really good like material for teenagers of how can abuse be present on your on the phone because everything can look normal right like I can look at my teenagers relationship and be like that's normal but what's being exchanged via text or in chat rooms is a hundred percent destructive and not okay and so one love does a great job of introducing the conversation of like how could this be happening and how do we handle it then if it's an electronic form of abuse? Um, And so I think being mindful of those things, going to those resources um, and even teachers, I think um, uh, teaching is so overwhelmed right now with all of the things I, I, I'm not trying to add to their plate, but I think having some, some type of awareness here of that my students are going to go places that they shouldn't and how are we going to approach that conversation or at least create the space for them to come talk to us yeah. and get better help and care for that is crucial. Absolutely. I wanted to make sure we hit on some tips for caregivers, um, especially when it comes to like the phones, the games, the apps, and making sure like keep the location tracking off on games and social media. Um, and that's something actually like if you ask kids, like what are some, si- like tell me, tell me what the security measures are on all of the apps and uh, systems that you named to me just now, and they will, they know them. They they also know that like, they'll keep it off. 
I would say if you have anybody over the age of 13, I would be asking who they have shared their location services with. Mm-hmm. Um, because I, I, to me, <laughs> I would be like, that should be a, a immediate family only have access to that information or maybe one other trusted person in our world. Um, but how many people can find them um, with nothing more than a push of a button yes. is, is terrifying. Yes. So yeah, l- asking about location services and also going on their phone. I think um, a lot of people are like, well, that's their phone. No, it's not. You pay the bill. So like they should be putting their phone down every night um, and, and don't make it a punishment. Just every night at six o'clock, everybody puts their phone on the dining room table and, yeah. and we can go through whether it's pornography that we need to talk about or location services or inappropriate games. I had a fourth grader talk about playing Call of Duty the other day. I'm like, come on, buddy. Like <laughs> yeah. from a developmental scope, that's just, that should be something that a parent knows about. No, I, that's great. So I don't want to, I don't want to keep Miss Emily here. We need to get her into those schools, right? Yes. So um, we're going to share another book by the same author as last week, um, yep. Janine Sanders. So this one is My Body, What I Say Goes. Have you read this one? Or I have. And I think it's really powerful because sometimes we discredit children from knowing their bodies. And this is a book that very much reminds us that kids have control of their bodies. And this is something we can teach and model. So, yeah, I really like this book. Good, because I was hoping you were going to say that. If you said no, we would have been like, whoops. You're like, get out. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you again for joining us here, Emily. Um, I think you have been such a gift to our listeners and the world. And I am so excited that you continue to be a part of our prevention team. So Awesome. Well, I look forward for the opportunity to come back and talk, hopefully, sometime. Oh, yeah. We Don't will worry. have you back. So <laughs> join us next time for Stages of Child Sexual Development. And thanks for listening. Keep listening to hear about support resources and how to contact us. Look out for new podcasts every other Monday on anywhere that you can find your podcasts, Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, Anchor FM, you name it. We're there. If you have any questions and we would love to hear from you, you can email us at saferjourneyspod at safejourneysillinois.org. You can also message us on social media. We have a Facebook and an Instagram that you can find us at. And let's talk about some resources for anyone who's experiencing abuse. If you happen to live in and around LaSalle or Livingston County in Illinois, please feel free to call Safe Journeys support line at 815-673-1555. 24-7, confidential, services are free. If you don't happen to be in our, our area, There are two national hotlines that you can call for support. For sexual violence, you can call RAIN with two N's. That's the National Sexual Violence Hotline. Their phone number is 800-656-HOPE. They also have a live chat on their website if you're interested. And for domestic violence or intimate partner abuse, you can call The Hotline, which is simply thehotline.org. And this is our national domestic violence hotline. And you can give them a call at 800 799 safe or chat live on the website. Thanks for listening.